We are you morning crew on We Are You Radio, the urban sound of pride. And this day, I have the titan, the voice, the icon, mother herself, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Martha Wash. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. How are you, lovely? I'm fine, George. How are you? I'm excited, great, grand, and glorious, giddy, beside myself, okay. all of the above. All of the, all of the above, huh? Okay. <laughs> I am a fan of both you and Sylvester. Uh, I always tell the story uh, about my coming to know who Sylvester was. I was actually mm. a 13 or 14 year old boy, and mm. uh, my family didn't have a lot. So a lot of the things that we had and we owned came from the Salvation Army. So mm -hmm. on this particular day, my mother and I were shopping at the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. and uh, my assignment was to go to the record, uh, the record section because they actually had a record section in the Salvation Army. Oh, wow! And I, I was able to pick a couple of records. So I pulled out a Commodores and an Earth, Wind, and Fire. I don't remember what the other record was, but I knew I could pick out two, so I picked those two out. Mm -hmm. And so she came over to look at what I had picked, and she said, "That's what you picked," and I said. Yes, ma'am. This is what I picked. So she goes back through the stacks and she grabs two more records. And she says, here, mm -hmm. you can have two more. And the two records she gave me was Sylvester's Too Hot to Sleep mm -hmm. and Patti LaBelle's The Spirits in It. Now, okay. I don't know what my mom was trying to tell me at the time. I don't know. I don't know what she was trying to tell me. <laughs> but, but those are the two that she gave me. And so that's how I came to know Sylvester years later. Living Proof album came out. Mm -hmm. And that was my introduction to the electricity, the excitement, a live recording. That was actually my first live recording that I ever heard. Mm -hmm. So now I want to take you back. Now that you know who I am, <laughs> how, I want to go back to that night at the uh, San Francisco Opera House, now the War Memorial uh, yeah. Opera House, I believe it's called now. I want to go back to that night and the electricity and the excitement. You are in the war memorial, standing backstage, getting ready to go on. Take me there. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me say, um, I used to shop at the Salvation Army too. And and, and for people for people who might turn up their nose to the Salvation Army, you can find some great things in the Salvation Army. I used to do it years and years ago when I was living in San Francisco. But Regarding the uh, the opera house, oh Lord, that was a <laughs> it was I would say very electric. Mm -hmm. The crowd itself was like a who's who of just people. I tell this story, any and everything that you could imagine seeing was there. From women in ball gowns to men with their asses, their ass cheeks out. Just a little <laughs> bit of everything and just excitement, very palpable. And us <laughs> backstage, we were getting ready and Everybody was nervous and just just excited to do this, this recording, you know, and be in front of these people and to be in this space where I think we were the second act at that time, like outside of classical music that was uh, performed there. We were the second act to perform there. The first act, non-classical if I'm not mistaken, was the Pointer Sisters. They had done uh, a show there and okay, we were like okay. the second ones. And so I remember when it, when it was time to go out, the the uh, the overture started. Izor and I, we, we went out. Uh, the background singers, the additional background singers, they came out and the place just erupted, just erupted. And the music was just, just going and going and going and we were su we were supposed to start singing the intro of the song you make my body strong well for me i 
couldn't start singing because my mouth had become very, very dry. It had felt like cotton. Oh, wow. And I was almost scared to start singing. And the music kept going and the overture just kept going and going and going. And I guess Sylvester said, hell, I guess I need to get out there so we can actually start the show. So when he came out, the place went up naturally. And that's when we all started singing the first part of You Make My Body Strong and just went on from there. That. That part I definitely remember. I was just standing there dancing from side to side, but I couldn't sing because my mouth <laughs> felt like cotton and dry and everything. So I so, said, shoot, what are we gonna do? We just standing there and the music is going and going and going. And he said, Okay, let's let's get this show started. So let me go on out there. But yeah, that's that's what I remember about the initial uh, uh start of the show. That is hilarious because <laughs> on the original recording and it, it it was well done. But on the new recording, at the end of the song, you can hear uh -huh. him say, well, I guess we fucked that one up. I was like, wait a minute. Uh, there, you, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I mean, the crowd didn't care. They didn't, they didn't care. care. They, they were just excited. They were just wow. excited. <laughs> yeah, he did, he did say that. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> did any of you think that that house would be that packed? that night i knew i yeah i kind of knew that i just didn't know to what ex extent mm -hmm. but i believed it was you know a, it was going to be a sold out experience and again it was i think it was just the crossbreed of people that showed up i think that mm -hmm. was the most interesting thing for me you know, just a little bit of everybody, all wow. and just seemingly all walks of life. You know, naturally, the gay community was very much was very much present and accounted for, you know. But outside of the gay community, so many other straight folks, you know, mm -hmm. black, white. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It was just an array of humanity. Do you think that that speaks to exactly who uh, Sylvester was? Because he, of course, he forged his own path. He did his own thing. Right. Sylvester was Sylvester unapologetically. So do you think right. that people gravitated from all walks of life because of that? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you either liked him or you didn't. He, he was not going to sugarcoat who he was. And I always say that if he was in this present point in time at his age then, and his career was set down into this space and time, uh, it wouldn't be anything about him being openly gay, black, all of that, it wouldn't matter because we have come a whole lot far, you know, mm -hmm. but at that time in the business we call show, it was not uh, outwardly accepted to the masses. That's the main thing. It was not outwardly accepted to the masses. People who were into music, liked his singing, were fans of him again outside of the gay community you know um but he i think he would be more accepted on a wider wider uh uh platform mm -hmm. you know there are so many people that have come after him that are openly gay and are accepted you know, for whatever their, you know, for who they are and what their talent is, you know. So that's why I say if he had continued to live, but was in his prime, if his prime was now, it wouldn't be, it would be no, no, I would, as they say, no tea, you know. 
I love it. I, you know, I, when I think when I think about Sylvester and his legacy, I, I, I like you believe that he was a magnet and, and and far beyond his time. But I also think that every yeah. artist that followed him, that is openly queer, uh, um, and presenting and or gay, um, mm -hmm. would not be here without a Sylvester. You would not be able to have a Billy Porter or a Lil Nas X or RuPaul or any right. of those those right. um, queer identifying artists. Right. At that moment, you growing up in church, having a church mm -hmm. background, was there ever a time that you said, is this, or your family or friends said, girl, what mm -hmm. are you doing? What What are you doing? You know, you know better. You know, you know what does say the Lord. Was there mm -hmm. ever a struggle for you? No, not for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not ever. Because uh, there were kids in my school that I knew that were gay. They were friends of mine. So that had nothing to do with, for me, had nothing to do with anything. Now, my <laughs> my parents, uh, when I told them I was going to be singing secular music and I was going to be singing in this group, they weren't necessarily happy about it. But they never said, oh, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. I was grown by then, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, even though they didn't necessarily necessarily like what I did, they would, it, they did in fact come to a few of our shows and they did come to the opera house show. The way my upbringing was, if you know anything about Kojic folks, that was not uh, what was supposed to be going on. Mm -hmm. But now the same, some of the same folks would come to my show. I would, cause I would see them every now and then at a couple of our shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, they never said no, don't do it. But they just—I I, want to say—they just kind of kept their mouth shut. But she grown; she's gonna do whatever she wants to do. And Sylvester, Sylvester even came to my church service one time. So, yeah, he came to, <laughs> I, 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 I invited him to a service that we were having in my church, and he came. Now uh, back to back to the opera house. What mm -hmm. were some of the the moments for you? As as a, as an artist, as a singer, that were like the moments, like yes, oh my god, I'm so glad we did this, or or that, oh my god, I can't believe we did this. I think the whole situation was just overwhelming, you know, because the audience was just right there with us. <laughs> Mistakes and all, whatever you know, whatever went wrong, they were right there with us, and and just having fun and enjoying everything that was going on and just like we were enjoying them because they were just oh they was a rowdy bunch <laughs> <laughs> i mean they wanted they wanted to literally bring the ceiling down on that building they, we were i'll tell you this we were not invited back ever again well you know okay. i heard during the during the recording that sylvester even mentioned that the opera house didn't want anyone to dance like, yeah, did, did well, they not know who they were inviting to be at the opera house? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because people were uh, people were up, you know, dancing and and clapping and singing and just carrying on. I mean, to the point that um, Sylvester's producer Harvey Fuqua, he was up standing up in the balcony, looking down at the the stage and stuff, and he said. And naturally, the balcony was full. The balcony started shifting because they were jumping up and down so much in the balcony, you know, to the point where, you know, you could almost feel like a slight earthquake, that kind of vibration and stuff. But yeah, it was one of those kind of things, one of them parties. <laughs> There, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just tuning in, we're speaking to the one and only the icon, Martha Wash, and the re release of the recording that was done at the uh San Francisco Opera House featuring Sylvester, Martha Wash, Azora Rhodes, um, and, and all of the collective of talent that night has been re re released with some unreleased, uh, well, previously unreleased uh tracks on that recording, so it's just a insight to what was going on and, and how that recording came to be and just some of the pieces that you missed. And I really wish, I know it's out there somewhere, but I really wish they would release that video. I don't know where it is. I don't know who's got it, but of I really the wish whole they would show? Of the whole show. Yes. Really? Because I've never, I've never seen it. I didn't, well, I didn't know actually that they were filming it. 
I knew it was being recorded live, but I didn't know if there was. It should. I. I don't know why. I shouldn't be surprised. Somebody would have if, if if Harvey didn't have it done. But I've never seen the uh, video of it. Now I want to uh, kind of shift a little bit and talk about mm -hmm. you, the icon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever said it, but I'll say it. When did you know you were that girl? I'm. I'm still looking for. Her. <laughs> after, after all these decades, I'm still looking for. Them. Really? I've never really, I've never really um, thought that. I've never really thought that. I think my my work in this business has been that work. You know, I kind of move on to the next thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. Uh, and then kind of looking back on it, I just say, well, damn, I guess I have done a lot of stuff. Huh? Or, you know, recorded a lot of stuff. But yeah, I'm still I'm still finding her. Wow. That's amazing to know that you had hits like Everybody, Everybody and and Everybody Dance Now and the, the hits that you had with you and Azora as Two Tons of Fun and then as The Weather Girls and your own solo uh, projects. And to, mm -hmm. to hear how humble you are and not realizing maybe uh, that you are that girl. I want to go back to for you. Um, and I know you've relived this moment a lot, but for some of the people who don't know that story, um, your voice has often been used, but not your image. Mm -hmm. And fast forwarding to an artist like Lizzo, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whose body, body positivity has impacted the industry and, and she's been allowed to be herself and herself. Mm -hmm. How do you feel in that moment in it, it was CNC Music Factory and uh, right now it escapes him. Ding, ding, Black ding, box. ding, ding. Yes. Uh, I bought the recording twice, by the way. I should know it, but Black Box. <laughs> yeah. um, how do you feel now juxtaposing that to the present, your voice being the thing that they wanted, but not your essence, not all of you? Uh, we have come a long way. I will say that. Just, just keep being, be who you are, you know? Um, I learned a long time ago, everybody's not going to like what you do, uh, whether you're a singer or whatever. Everybody's not going to like what you do. And if you're okay with that, then you'll be fine. Just keep doing you, whatever that you is, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's, I think it's gotten better. It's still a long way to go. Because for a time, and to some degree, even still, appearance trumps talent. So mm -hmm. it's about, op it's always about optics. It's always mm -hmm. about optics. And at that time, the big girls were not optical optimum. Say it again for the you people know. in the back. <laughs> <laughs> The big, big girls were not optical optimum. Wow. You know, uh, and because somebody had 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 mentioned to me years ago, they said, do you realize that before Two Tons of Fun came out, there were really no large women out front who were art main artists. You would find them in the background. Mm hmm but not really main artists. Let me yeah. let me go to that for a second because the name for a lot of people was like, <gasps> I don't know if I could say that. I remember uh -huh. uh, Dick, Dick Clark on American Band saying in particular, uh, you guys had just finished performing uh, uh, with Sylvester and yeah. he, he was going to say the name of the group, but he right. would not let it come out of his mouth. Um, uh -huh. How did you feel about taking something that, could have been negative and right. making that the positive of for you and Azor. Well, we were kind of okay, we were kind of okay with it. Uh there was a point though at one time where we got a cease and desist letter. I think she was a burlesque artist and she wanted us to cease and desist using the name two tons of two tons of fun. Yeah, some kind of way we got past all that. But uh it was very tongue in cheek and it kind of like you said it would kind of stun people, you know, but, but I guess for the ones that really kind of got it, 
they laughed and said, okay, I get it. Get it. You know, mm. two, two, you know, two large women. We know they don't each weigh a thousand pounds. Okay. But mm. we get it. But wow. the but the but the the good thing about it was we, we could sing. Absolutely. You know, there was no doubt. There was no doubt about it. Sing. Yeah. Now looking again, and I want to focus on on your career and, and your your career path. Looking yeah. at your dis your discography, the mm -hmm. Martha Wash disc discography, in what era were you like, I'm this is it. This is what I'm doing. This is what I like. This is what I created. What era was that for you, do you think? Was it two tons of fun? What where was that? Oh Lord. I think maybe the first solo album, the first Martha Wash album would give it to you and and, and carry on and those mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah. And and why? Yeah. I I was moving into the uh, more R and B, I would say, on a lot of those tracks, even though they were <laughs> remixed for house and all other kind of genres and stuff, you know. But I think that first album was very, very cool for me. I enjoyed it. And Brian Alexander Morgan, he he produced a lot of those songs. He wrote and produced a lot of those songs. And I'm glad you picked that 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 album because for me that was the reintroduction of Martha Wash. Um, mm -hmm. I re I remember seeing the photo and I was like, this woman is so beautiful. I, and I I don't mean to embarrass you. I was like, this woman mm -hmm. is so beautiful. Oh my god. Um, and then fast forwarding, you know. Here she is, the voice again. This beautiful woman is not being shown in this damn video. Even before <laughs> I'm watching the CNC Music Factory, anybody make you sweat video, and I'm looking and, and, and knowing nothing about what was going on. I'm looking at this woman and I'm like, now y'all know that voice ain't coming out this woman, right? Y'all know that ain't her singing. We got in hard, deep down arguments before the scandal broke about. Uh -huh who this voice belonged to uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and bless her because Velma actually could sing in her own right. So it was yeah. unfortunate yeah. that both of you were put in that position because now anything that she would want to do in the future would be looked at like, girl, okay. And you um, were in the background. Put us there for yeah. a second in that era, at that moment. Uh, well, that whole situation was hard, you know, um, but I prevailed. I prevailed and went on to work with them again. Was that was that was that hard to do, knowing what they had already done to you and to your voice? Well, let's put it like this. I would say I don't think they would ever try that again. But look, I'll I'll say it like this. In this <laughs> in this business. People have sued each other. I want to say, I guess, over and over again, you know, depending on what the situation has been like. And they settle it. Then they turn around and work with each other again. So it's really wow. nothing new. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now let, let's fast forward because I, I want to get to the present. Uh, I just wanted you to share those stories because I know there's a lot of people that mm -hmm. have not heard them before. Um, First ladies of disco, you, Linda Clifford, and mm -hmm. Evelyn Champagne King. First of all, girl, these three dynamos on the stage at one time when I first heard it, and we played the record, the, the first single um, from you guys here on the station as well. I actually mm -hmm. love it. Let's talk about how those three forces came together. The name First Ladies of Disco is actually from a book that was written by our author, James Arena. What he did was he interviewed 31 women who were around in the disco uh, era. And he interviewed us and put it into a book form of <laughs> us surviving the 70s and our experiences during that time and our careers. James Washington, uh, who's my manager and business partner, he said, you know what? We need to expand on mm -hmm. uh this and let's put a show together called first ladies of disco well we we got um linda and evelyn and myself but 
the show itself is an interchangeable show because since we've had Evelyn, Norma Jean came in. Um, and if, if and you don't know who Norma Jean Wright is, ladies and gentlemen, she Norma is Jean from Wright, formerly she. of She. Yes, right. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So she's come in. And in fact, we're getting ready to do uh, a show September 29th in uh, Las Vegas at Myron's uh, at the Smith Center. And this time around, it'll be myself, uh, Miss Jeannie Tracy and uh, Miss Charlene Moore and uh, comedian Marsha Warfield. It's a fun show. You know, we all do our hits and things like that. And then we play we pay tribute to uh the the ones that were around in the 70s and 80s and the 90s so it's a spectrum of pop rock soul funk you know just all the kind of music that a lot of people grew up listening to it brings back a lot of memories and stuff you know and we have had parents come out with their maybe teenage to adult children and they just have a great time because it brings back so many memories. You have been embraced by the LGBT community. It, you, you are mother to a lot of <laughs> us. And so what do you say um, to all of us who, who see you that way, that, that, that icon, mother, that, that voice, that girl, as we say in the community? What do uh -huh. you say to all of those artists as well? Well, uh, I would say... Thank you for uh, sticking with me all these decades, because that's what it's been decades, <laughs> you know, and I thank God I'm here. Um, still trying to do whatever I'm trying to do, you know, but I I'm thankful for the gay community for uh, the support. And I know a lot of us, uh, a lot of us girls that that have been doing it for a long time. Thank you, too. You know, um, I don't take it for granted. I've always been a supporter of of the uh, of the community uh, because it's it's always been my largest fan base. You know, it's always been my largest fan base, and I support uh, I support them and the things that they have tried to what they are doing and have tried to do over the decades as far as their freedom, I'll say, you know, it's, um, it's been hard, but Hey, they've, they've made strides. They've made strides and it's, <laughs> well, you keep praying that it gets better. It, I, I, I pray that it keeps getting better for them as well as all of us where we can become a nation of, of people with liberty and justice for all if you can't find it for one person or 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 one religion or or a particular group of people then there's still no justice and liberty for all. Now, I've heard you say this, say this a couple of times, so I'm going to ask you because now I'm in my Oprah bag. You no. said uh, a couple of times, whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm doing it, it, I'm doing it, but whatever it is that I'm doing, is there something on that list that you feel you've left undone, you want to do, that you haven't been able to do? Uh, Yeah, I'd like to do a gospel album. I keep saying I want to do a, a gospel album. People know me. Well, I started, you know, singing with Sylvester and then we went into the, you know, the disco music and in the dance music and the house music and, and, and all of that. But I've never, ever wanted to be pigeonholed into one box, one type of music. So people know or they 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 came to to know me with the dance music and people continue to want me to be in the dance music. And I'm saying, no, um, I've done all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I could, I, I can, I can do that stuff standing on my head. 
the last two albums that I put out, uh, Something Good and this last one, Love and Conflict, different, totally yes. different. Totally, yes. Pop, pop, rock, little blues. This last one, uh, Love and Conflict, bluesy, jazzy. Um, and I want to expand you know sometimes you have to kind of pull your audience with you <laughs> sometimes they're kicking and screaming you know they're saying no, mm -hmm. no 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 but eventually it kind of grows on them i would i would absolutely love to hear you do a gospel album that baby that would that would kill the people that, that baby <laughs> <laughs> baby, B baby, you put some of that Kojic on there, <laughs> girl. They ain't ready. They ain't ready. They ain't ready. Is there any gospel artist or producer or writer that you would like to work with if you did this this project? Now I'm getting in your business, girl. <laughs> that you, <laughs> honey. Yeah, yeah. I like. Uh, well, I love Donna Lawrence. Uh, but I, I am a big, I am a big lover of um, Pastor John P. Key. And he's a big old country boy, so I I can I can understand that and, and you know get behind that. Oh, wow. but uh, Donna Lawrence, Donna Lawrence, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time out. This has been amazing, amazing to be able to talk to you today, um, and have this conversation and go back down memory lane and just and just see and speak to the icon and everything that you do. We want to support you. So, how can we follow you on social media? Uh, you know, follow your shows and things like that. Uh, my website is MarthaWash.com. Uh, you can find me on First Ladies of Disco Show on Facebook. Yes, on uh, Facebook. Yeah, on Facebook. Oh, okay. Lord, you know, there's a whole bunch of handles trying to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, my love. You make it a great day. We appreciate you. We love you. We adore you. And we support you absolutely in any time anything that Martha Watch <laughs> does for the children, we want to be a part of that. So make sure that you let us know. I appreciate it so much and good luck with the show too.